will try to do this in 10 to 15 minutes, but this is such a big topic that please feel free to reach out to me if there's anything that um, any resources you need, or if you need clarification on anything I've said, um, like I said, it's a really big topic and, and trying to pack it all in 10 to 15 minutes was um, a bit challenging. But today we will do a brief overview of the science of learning, and then I will share some of the resources that I have found helpful. So here you can um, use this short URL to snag a copy of the slides. Um, it will be helpful for you to have a copy of this because you'll have resources and URLs that are at the end of this presentation, especially if you are interested in this topic. So I'll give you just a second. And Erin, I did just start to record. I don't know if you did or not, but I just started it. Okay. Thank you, Deniga. Uh, I asked her to remind me. I knew I would forget the recording. <laughs> Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Erin McNeil, and I'm a professional learning specialist at Keep Indiana Learning. I received my doctorate from Indiana University in literacy, so I am excited to share with you something that I've been studying for a really long time. Um, so in today's session, we will do a brief overview of all things science of reading. So a brief overview of some of the research um, and then the tenets of science of reading, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So as I said, I'm going to review these tenets very quickly due to time restraints, but I have been working on a webinar series that reviews each of these tenets um, a little more thoroughly. So each presentation is about 10 to 15 minutes long. We are going to start releasing these tomorrow and we'll release them every Thursday once a week. So um, this link at the top is the um, link to the YouTube channel where you can get these as they are published and it will take you straight to that playlist. So you can access those once they are released if you're interested. Okay, so what is the science of reading? Um, the best definition I have seen is that it is a phrase that represents the accumulated knowledge about reading, reading development, and best practices for reading instruction obtained by the use of the scientific method. So a little history about the science of reading. You all may remember the reading wars in the 80s and 90s where researchers and practitioners debated on how reading was best taught. Um, so in 2000, Congress asked the National Reading Panel to review all of the reading research that was available at that time. It ended up being a little over 100,000 studies that they reviewed. And the National Reading Panel made it clear that the best approach to reading instruction is one that incorporates explicit instruction and phonemic awareness, systematic phonics instruction, methods to improve fluency, and then ways to improve comprehension. So from that research, these five ideas, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension, have found their ways into classrooms. And although these five ideas make up the science of reading, um, they are taught together and they are taught in conjunction with one another. So the science of reading does not begin and end with phonics, but it is an important component. So our brains are designed to understand speech sounds, but then we have to learn to convert letters into speech sounds. We actually make new pathways in our brains when we learn to read. Um, so it isn't a natural activity, it's a learned one. So let's review what happens in the brain when someone learns to read. So Dr. Dehane has a fascinating book. Um, he is a cognitive scientist and he runs a neuroimaging institute where he actually put children in MRI machines as they were learning to read. Um, so he says that written word processing starts in our eyes. Um, 
A scientist named Edmund Newey created eye tracking software, and that software help us, helped us to realize that our eyes do actually track every letter in a word. Um, so it is important for us as a reader to then decompose a word into phonemes and eventually morphemes. So when that happens, um, we transmit the, the word we have seen into a place in our brain that Dr. DeHane has called the letterbox. And in frequently used words, then follow a path where we found, find the sounds. So we convert letter strings to sounds. But if we have used the word frequently, we don't have to do that anymore. And we then can identify word meaning. So it goes to two paths. If we know it well, um, it's in our semantic filter, which is meaning. And if we don't know it well, it goes to our orthographic filter, which is us trying to sound out the word. So let's watch a short video that explains what this looks like. Um, I do highly recommend if you're interested in this, either the book, um, Reading in the Brain, or he has a 33 minute video about how the brain learns to read. They're both excellent. Today, I want to talk specifically about the topic of reading and what we understand about it from the brain's point of view. I want to show you a sort of caricature that you can remember. And it's very simply that reading starts as any other visual stimulation in these generic visual areas of the occipital pole of the brain, but then very quickly moves into an area that we have discovered, which concentrates the recognition of the written word. I have called it the brain's letterbox because it is where we store our knowledge of letters. And from there, what you have seen is its explosion of activity into at least two networks one that concerns the meaning of the words, and another that concerns the pronunciation and the articulation of the word. And so we can say essentially from the brain's point of view that learning to read consists first in recognizing the letters uh, and how they combine into written words, and second, connecting them to these systems coding for speech sounds and for meaning. Okay, so since neuroimaging research shows us that we break down words into sounds first, phonemic awareness is especially important to beginning readers. And that is the ability to hear and move around the sounds in words. So our brains recognize all the letters and then they need to incorporate the visual word into their memory. So processing the sound in a word several times, which is called orthographic mapping, allows us to recognize the whole word. So the goal is to process sounds until we recognize whole words. So for example, you didn't simply just read the words on this slide, you said them aloud in your head. So we turn written words into spoken language in order to comprehend them, which is when we switch from the sound filter in our brain to the semantic filter or the meaning filter in our brain. So after students learn the sounds of letters, we move to phonics, which is the knowledge that letters of the alphabet represent phonemes and then they are blended together. And readers who are skilled in phonics can sound out words they haven't seen before. So they don't have to just memorize every word in the dictionary. So one of the important research studies behind the use of phonics was completed by Bruce McCandless and his colleagues. And they studied together, they studied whether words were taught better using letter to sound instructions such as phonics or a whole word association method. They took 16 literate adults and taught them a made up script of lines and curves, made up words. Some were taught to memorize whole words and then others were taught to decode the script. So after learning multiple words under both approaches, the newly learned words were presented in a reading test while they monitored the brain waves of these 16 participants. So 24 hours later, the adults were more efficient at remembering how to decode the words by sounding them out than at remembering whole words. So effective phonics instruction um, has a strong scope, what you will teach, a strong sequence, the order you will teach it, 
and a solid routine how you will teach it. One great resource for phoneme and phonics instruction um, is Birkins and Yates Shifting the Balance. Um, and this text is available um, many places, but they also have a website called the sixshifts.com where they have free resources that you can download um, that explain what way phonemes and phonics should be taught. They also have some vocabulary resources and there's also some courses that are not free but that you can sign up for if you're interested in those resources. Okay, and then the next step in the science of reading is fluency. And fluency is known as the bridge between phoneme and phonics instruction and comprehension. Dr. Tim Rosinski is known as an excellent resource for fluency research in the classroom applications for this research. Um, he has a blog where he, I believe it's every Wednesday, he gives free resources on this blog. and. Um, I do know that he gives vocabulary word ladders every Wednesday for free. So it's a great thing to sign up for and just to see what kind of free resources um, are available there. So Dr. Rosinski also advocates for readers theater as an effective fluency practice. He believes testing how fast kids can read in passages does not create fluency in readers, but instead working to perform for an authentic audience shows results in fluency. So these are the steps that he uses. Of course, there are several different ways to do readers theater, and there's several free resources as well to find scripts for students. Um, but he assigns them parts and then has them practice all week, either aloud or silently, and then he asks them to perform for an audience on Friday. Sometimes the audience is their peers and sometimes it is parents dependent on who is there. Paired reading is another research-based fluency strategy where students read aloud to each other. Um, and you can do this several ways. More fluent readers can be paired with less fluent readers. Um, I had trouble doing this when I was teaching students how to read because of the, the drastic levels differences in my classroom. So um, we pair to reread stories or to practice reading aloud. So vocabulary is the next step in um, the science of reading. And vocabulary knowledge is really about how flexibly vocabulary can be used in a given context. So it's not just about memorization, but it's about understanding the multiple meanings of words in various contexts. So Freddie Hebert um, has a book called Teaching Words and How They Work. And she believes that all vocabulary knowledge needs to be generative. So we need to teach students patterns and features that underline these words. And we need to teach students how to extend knowledge of, wor of new words to the words they already know. So she completed a study that of all the exemplar texts identified by Common Core Standards, and she found an average of 91.5% of words came from 2,500 word families. So what she has done with this information is she has put it in nice core vocabulary sheets in her website, textproject.org. Um, so she believes that small vocabulary changes can equal big results. And that is by having conversations with students about um, where words came from, teaching collections of words. So for example, instead of teaching um, the seven words that come with our text, we are teaching, um, we find one of those words and then find all of the synonyms that go with that word or all of the antonyms and teach them around a theme. Um, core reading, meaning the core words that she has found, or choice reading, so allowing students to pick what they're reading and then the words they want to learn. But again, she has lots of good resources on textproject.org. And finally, comprehension. Um, so it's understanding and interpreting what we read. So we need to, number one, be able to decode Number two, we have to make connections. And then number three, we have to think deeply about what we read. 
So we know that students learn best when they connect to the required curriculum through prior experience and knowledge, but sometimes required curriculum can make those connections challenging for teachers, but we could consider scenes in a text where students can make a connection. One way that I have done this is by thinking about um, elements of culture or community in text. So looking at cultural or religious traditions that students could connect with, community gatherings, um, how students could relate to what's happening with the characters, and then of course the text to self, text to world, and text to text connections. We can also use visualization strategies, but I do wanna caution that research shows that this is only an effective strategy for proficient readers. So students that are still learning to read, um, using visualization is not an effective um, comprehension strategy because they are still learning to decode those words. But if they have learned decoding skills, visualization can be um, very important in their comprehension. So visualizing means that we're picturing in our head what we are reading. So one way to do this is by starting small. So giving students practice doing this first. So saying something like um, giving students a noun and actually asking them to picture it in their head. So maybe saying, um, I am picturing a cup. Would you picture a cup in your head? Now draw what is in your mind. And then you have to add some descriptive details. In the cup, there are several flowers that are different colors with several different leaves. And then asking students to draw that. Um, I think it's also important for us to ask students to share these drawings so they can see that um, we all think differently and we're all visualizing different things. So our metacognitive strategy strategies are different even though we're hearing the same words. So that was a very quick overview of how all of these ideas work together to create the components of the science of reading. So um, please fill out this short survey um, and let us know what you thought of the presentation um, and if there are any other things I can help with about the science of reading. <laughs>